We have Overpass for building out Pudgy World, uh, amazing retail announcements for Pudgy Toys over the next coming months. And truth be told, I'm just gonna do everything that we've been doing. I'm just gonna keep doing it better, keep getting the content better, keep growing the followers to even larger numbers. And ultimately, I think when we talk next, Matt, um, I will be the face of NFTs and I'll be on the path to being the number one NFT project in the world with the highest floor price is really my objective. Welcome back to the NFT Now podcast. I'm Matt Medved, and today's guest is the CEO of one of the hottest projects in the space, Luca Nets from Pudgy Penguins. Pudgy Penguins are coming off their absolutely massive Pudgy Toys launch that saw the toys top the charts on Amazon and do more than $500,000 in sales volume over two days. I'm excited to dive in deep with Luca to learn more about what appealed to him about the Pudgy Penguins IP, how he turned the project around, and what his plans are for the future uh, of maximizing what has become one of the space's biggest success stories. Before we jump in, I want to encourage you to sign up for our free weekly newsletter at nftnow.com slash newsletter. Each week, we distill everything that's happening in the space into actionable insights straight to your inbox to help you navigate Web3. Without any further ado, Luca Nets from Pudgy Penguins. Luca, such a pleasure to have you on the NFT Now podcast, man. Obviously been uh, a big month for you with Pudgy Toys. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing great as well. Finally back in New York, was doing a lot of Asia travel, um, dropped by VCon. And uh, you know, you know how it is. It's like this the top of this month was like super loaded with conferences and events and the like, and looking forward to having a, a, some heads down time to build, you know? Uh, likewise, I've got uh, two more stretches ahead of me. I have licensed the expo from the 13th to the 15th, and then I have San Diego Comic-Con. And once that is it, I am going on a event hiatus. I feel you, man. I feel you. I think it's important, you know? Um, well, look, we have a lot to talk about. Let's jump in. Um, Let's go. Let, let's start at the top. Just like briefly, tell us a bit about your backstory prior to Web three and your journey into Web three. Yeah, so I basically uh, grew up homeless with my mom and my brother for about ten years. Uh, went to Fairfax High School. Once we finally settled down to London, Los Angeles, uh, dropped out of high school. Got my first, uh, actually, my first job or company that I started was throwing underground rap shows in South Central Los Angeles. I uh, did that for about twelve or six months and. Turn found out that when I did the math, I would probably make more money making, you know, uh, earning minimum wage. And so I got a job at a tech startup called Ring Doorbells, one of their early employees. I did that for about uh, a year. And then I started my, or a little bit longer than that, 18 months, 19 months. And then I started uh, my own business, which was selling jewelry online. I sold that business when I was 19 for quite a bit of money. At 20, I uh, started monetizing social influence, which is really how I made my career and reputation. Uh, a lot of influencer brands that you see today were incubated and started by uh, you know, what we were doing at my company. Uh, and then we, um, then I got into Gel Blaster, um, became their biggest investor and also their CMO, and uh, took that to basically become North America's fastest growing toy company. All the while, uh, I had friends in the space. I loved digitally collecting. Uh, actually, uh, was a part of you know some of my friends had um, certain projects, and I was like looking at what they were doing. You know, had a little marketing Instagram thing that I helped them with. Uh, and then overarching, I came to the conclusion that I loved pudgy penguins. I had loved it as it was my first you know PFP that I had ever purchased, and. Uh, I coincidentally went on a spiritual retreat to Sedona. And as I was leaving Sedona, Arizona, somebody had tweeted, hey, uh, we're making an offer to buy Pudgy Penguins. And then in my gut, I was already frustrated with the current landscape. I was frustrated with NFTs uh, because of, I was disappointed because of how much money people had raised from community and venture and how little, little output they were delivering. It seemed like everybody was honing in on keywords like they're the next IP or the, the next great game or the next great you know innovator in music. And it didn't really seem like anybody was doing anything. 
Um, and so I was frustrated not only with the Pudgy Penguin team, but just the space in general. And rather than complaining, I said, well, uh, this is a perfect opportunity to lead the charge uh, in an NFT project, which I ultimately believe is the future of technology and the future of collecting and uh, step up to the plate. And so uh, it's been a wild 13, 14 months ever since. Uh, I'm super thankful and grateful for the journey. And I've evolved uh, as an entrepreneur in ways that I couldn't possibly imagine. And so um, loving my pudgy pengus and grateful to be here. It's an amazing story. It's an amazing story. And, you know, people forget, like, take us like take us back to like April 2022, right? Like people forget that at one point, like the Pedgy Penguins project really seemed dead in the water, right? Like there was nothing in the treasury. There was all the scandal with everything around coal. Um, what was it? that appealed to you about the Pungy Penguins? What was it about that IP that that gave you the conviction to to, to purchase it? For It was, what, 750 ETH, around 2.5 million at the time? Yeah, and so for me, it was interesting because being a part of Gel Blaster, I went to every conference, I went to you know listen to every major toy and IP business speak. We were trying to collaborate with them and we were also competing with some. And I really learned about all of these amazing characters that were globally recognized and huge but before you know diving into the business i had no idea what they were and pudgy penguins in the traditional world shares all of the same characteristics that a lot of these multi-billion dollar ips shared and so from a traditional standpoint it was always really exciting i always thought it had the highest potential and the most upside in terms of in terms of garnering that audience Pudgy Penguins also had something that was really interesting, which was a 2021 super native OG DeFi and memer culture community, which to be frank, you know, I bought it for two and a half million, but you you can't really fundraise and, and say, hey, I'm going to do an NFT project, raise 100 million bucks and curate and cultivate that community. You either have it or you don't. Uh, and in this situation, I was fortunate enough to buy it. But th these are the things that I think matter in crypto. And its historical significance and what it did to really kick off the space. Uh, that 2020 run in the summer of, you know, July and August of 2021, you know, what it did really in August, I think set the tone for a craze um, that ultimately has led us here. And you can't just buy that. Like that, that is unquantifiable marketing dollars and cachet and provenance and significance that you either have or you don't. And in crypto, that type of significance and provenance matters. And so when you look at Pudgy Penguins and you looked at, okay, my skill set as being an elite product mover and an elite marketer uh, and an elite doer of things alongside this IP, this beautiful Pudgy Penguin character that is, in my opinion, the best Penguin IP ever made. They've always made Penguins ugly for some reason. And Pudgy Penguins are cute and adorable. And people love Penguins, just like they love dogs, cats, and lions. And so... You have this traditional IP that clearly fills a necessary void because right now there is no premier penguin brand. And so void, right? It has all of the ingredients to be successful traditionally. And me being a product mover, that excites me. On the Web3 side, it's no, it, it, it doesn't lack anything from, from its culture and community and significance and provenance. It has all of those ingredients. And so when you're looking at what it could be, if you combine, you know, web two ingredients and potential and web three ingredients and potential to me, you know, all it took or all it needed was the right leadership and the right vision that if you combine the two, you would have what I ultimately think we're going to have, which is the face of NFTs, the premier case study for what it is to build a brand in NFTs, web three's first real brand and web three's first real IP business. And that's ultimately what we want to create. And so it was those two ingredients on those two polar opposites of the spectrum that really excited us to say, you know, everybody is, you know, doing their own thing, dropping the ball at this thing that they're doing. And here we have this beautiful character and community that has, in our opinion, the most upside, because in this world of abstract characters and personal preferences and, you know, uh, you know, PG-13 traits and characteristics, the IP itself is the most well-positioned and the most well-understandable across all genders and demographics, in my opinion, right? I think if you look at the penguin and you throw the penguin in middle America, Tennessee, or mainland China, or somewhere in Portugal, everyone understands what the pudgy penguin is. 
And if you apply that ethos to, this, to a lot of, uh, I would say 99.9% of other NFT projects in the space, I, I think they don't share that same advantage. And so my job is really just to amplify that. Uh, I believe the space is the future and we're doing our part in shaping that future. I love that. I love that. Uh, really seeing a gap in the market and, and understanding how this was uniquely uh, situated as an opportunity. Um, and so obviously there was a lot of excitement when you when you took over Pudgy Penguins. But as we know, in Web3, things move really quickly. There, there's definitely a, a quick shelf life to that. Holders, holders want results. What were what were some of like the biggest challenges that you faced in like actually turning this thing around? You know, the hardest part for us was we really uh, got hit with every. Sorry, I just asked for the skateboard. I just I was like, Ooh, I, to, I was looking at my back and I was like, dude, we got to put. There's got to be a better thing in the background. I'm going to put it there in a sec. Thanks, <laughs> awesome. I leveled mine up recently, you know, with there, the, you know, yeah. um, you know, for us, I think the challenges really came with the macro. I honestly, I mean, I, I've had countless people tell me this and I believe this because I'm a, I have a good finger on the pulse in the market, but geez, some of the things that we've accomplished and done, if we were in a bowl, I mean, we would be in, in, in a whole different territory right now, I believe, because uh, I think we've really done that great job up until this point. Um, I think the hardest parts for us you know, naturally I'm an empath. And so naturally I, I know how to communicate. I know how to interact with people like this is, you know, I, I, I love that part. So, you know, I always knew me and the community would get along. I was never really concerned about that. I think the hard part for us was really these black swans that the universe dealt us. I mean, at one point I actually was, had to dig into the bank account and put more money into the business more than the actual purchase because even our worst projections didn't, didn't, we didn't account NFT volume getting cut 95%. And then we didn't account royalties leaving. And we didn't account, you know, Ethereum taking us 80% haircut all in the same time. Right. And so Ethereum took an 80% haircut. NFT volume took a 95% haircut. And so all of these things where I thought, okay, you know, I'm factoring worst case scenario. Worst case scenario is probably like, you know, 70, 80% of, across both verticals or one wouldn't necessarily trump the other. And we basically just got hit with, you know, I knew royalties were not the the revenue drivers for this business. To me, royalties are EBITDA patterns. And so that's how I look at them from a revenue model. But at the time, I thought royalties would be able to sustain us up until we got our real revenue drivers going. And so it's for this reason uh, that that I think we got dealt a lot of really interesting cards and all the things that come with that, all the things that come with not paying, you know, your whole entire team, 80% of the team didn't get paid for for 11 months. Like what, what that's, what does that come with? Well, that comes with internal friction and expectations. And, you know, I can only say so much to somebody I'm not paying. Right. And so like all of those lever points, if you just like, again, is on its surface, you can say black swan events and not making any money, but being an entrepreneur, I'm sure you understand, okay, what does it mean to not make any money in a business? What is it? What are those? How does that create the friction? What stress does that really create? And uh, I'm so thankful to have a, an amazing team, you know, behind me really, really doing all the hard work and all the amazing things. All I do is envision it and, to, you know, put the people together. But uh, I'm thankful they stuck through and we were able to make it on the other side. And now that we have funding, I think a majority of that hard time and hardship is behind us. And now it's just about moving forward. But those would probably be the hard things for us with those Black Swan events. I love that. I love that. It always takes a team, right? And, uh, you know, I, I, it's just this is great to hear that. And, and, you know, I think that there's a lot to dig into. We'll talk about the royalties. We'll talk about uh, the funding. We'll talk about the IP. Um, but I'm curious too, like, when was, was there a moment when like you kind of felt the pendulum swing when you were like, obviously so many headwinds, obviously like a lot of black swan events, you know, welcome to web three, right? Like ne never a dull moment, but you know, you persevered through what, when did you kind of feel like you were kind of pushing through like when you saw the light or, or you were kind of breaking through the other side? Yeah. So I'll attribute this to probably my best friend in the space. His name is Frank from the D gods. I think he, uh, you know, gave me a little bit of a coaching lesson one day where he basically said he was so impressed with what we were doing, but I wasn't doing a good job galvanizing and spreading that vision, which is really my job as a CEO. And I think probably within those last, within those first couple of days of him telling me that, I think started the uptrend for Pudgy Penguins, which was, you know, being a little more vocal. So, you know, I have a thing and historically in Web2, I never really talked about my successes. I just showed them. I just showed you. I just let the, I let the results do the talking. That was always my mantra because I I grew up in LA. Everybody in LA is a, you know either lying or a trust fund baby or the, one of the above, and it's just like you're not actually doing it yourself. And so I just wanted to be the guy that was like, hey, uh, I I am going to do this, 
and I'm just going to show you. And while I was showing everybody, nobody was watching. Nobody was paying attention. And it was because I wasn't doing a good job spreading the vision and getting people excited about what we were doing. Because naturally, I was programmed and I've been programmed in my entrepreneurial endeavors to show, just be a doer. Everyone loves to talk. Everyone's a talker. But I'm the, I'm the one who really does it. And so what he made me kind of realize was the combination of the both, the talking about it and the doing. And I was like, well, I know how to do the doing. And I'm naturally a pretty good speaker. So all I got to do is muster up the courage because I'm an introvert. So it does require a little bit of courage, muster up the courage to go galvanize and go spread the vision in these places. And so thankfully, uh, I was able to put two and two together with the help of my good friend, Frank. Uh, and I think that was probably the huge moment because a lot of people in the space make a lot of amazing things. They create a lot of amazing utilities or products. And those things fall in deaf ears. And the reason why they fall mm. in deaf ears is because they don't have a champion of those products. They don't have the person to get the community excited to galvanize, galvanize and translate that vision or why that product is important. A lot of people create amazing products, but they don't know why it's important. You know, one of the things that I think we did best about this toy rollout, and you'll notice it, don't underestimate the rollout of the toy because anybody can go release toys. People have beat mm. us to toys all the time. Gary V beat me to retail shelves a long time ago. Why was Pudgy Penguin so impactful? Well, I think we told a better story, right? We licensed the IP. Uh, we brought NFT IP to the real world, which Gary also did. But we also brought NFT technology. But how we rolled it out with the Trojan horse graphics before the explainer, the unboxing, right, which got its own, which its own banger post. And you actually seeing the technology in real time to really snap that aha moment, I think, was was the differentiator. And so sometimes it's not only about execution, but how you translate that execution. And I think this is something we do at Pudgy Penguins very well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and shout out to Frank. We had him on the podcast last month. Um, really, really uh, visionary guy who, who also understands uh, the power of attention in the space, right? And and how to capture it and how to maintain it and how to how to do so in a genuine but effective way, right? And yeah. so, um, you know, that is something that I've that I also have noticed um, from from Pudgy Penguins. You know, um, while the while the NFT space is like you know so focused on Twitter, you guys have been crushing it on Instagram. You know, and I've I've seen it with the reels. I've seen it like reaching a much wider audience. There, I'm curious, like, how do you think about the role of different platforms? Uh, in gaining traction and getting this IP in front of a wider audience? I think it's just about, you know, why we created toys and wanted to go in this real revenue stream in the first place, which was, hey, we have to control our own destiny. I gave my life to this. I, we, 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 you know, collectively, this team has put two and a half million dollars, you know, basically earned no pay over 12 months and so sacrificed our time, our energy and the opportunity costs to get here to build this thing. And I am not going to lose by any means. But if I keep my eggs in one basket, I'm inevitably compromising my future and the future of this company and the future of our holders. And I almost feel like it'd be fiscally irresponsible of me to not go and do these things, right? Like, because I think, I think even Elon's takeover and there's nobody I respect more from an entrepreneur perspective than, than Elon Musk. But you know, they're over there tweaking Twitter all the time. The algorithm one day is the best thing I've ever seen. And the next day it's like, geez. And so, you know, how can I be subjugated to variables I can't control is a fool's game. And I have no interest in playing a fool's game. I have every interest in playing a wise man's game and a wise man uh, would diversify his uh, attention. Uh, if we were in the attention economy and you're in the attention business, a wise man would diversify where he's garnering that attention. And so that's... Uh, that's how we kind of think of it. I want to be able to control my destiny living on one or two platforms as I have no intention of doing it. I honestly, one day, then the next year, and you can hold me to this, Matt, when we talk, I want to have the biggest Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, and Giphy of anybody in the Web3 space. And ultimately, after we do that in a year, go and tackle the traditional IPs. We will have two. We have one already. We have the number one Giphy out of any Web3 IP. We're a month away from having the number one Instagram by followers and engagement on that. And over the next couple of months, we'll tackle all the other social medias. We just got unshadow banned on TikTok. And so that's finally working again. Uh, I'm excited for that because that's one I know we're going to crush uh, and gain momentum on pretty quickly. But this is how I look at things. And uh, I think that's the right way to look at it. Boom. You heard it here first, everyone. Uh, super exciting. Uh, let's, let's dive into Pudgy Toys. So Smash debut, 
topped the Amazon charts, brought in more than 500K in two days. Like, what's the vision behind Pudgy Toys? And tell us a bit about the execution. Because you, as you mentioned, the rollout was so important to its success. Like, how did you take it from idea uh, to fully realized success? Yeah, so to understand Pudgy Toys on its face to the regular person, it's a cute, cuddly, you know, Pudgy Penguin. But to the Web3 world, you know, how we rolled it out, we were really clear in our messaging. And all credit to this guy on our team named, named Vidan is one of the most important people at the Pudgy Penguins team. But he helped kind of curate this idea. And really, the vehicle of the toy is quite literally a Trojan horse. And it's a Trojan horse for getting people into Web3 without them knowing. On its face, it's a cute little Pudgy Pengu. But attached to it is a birth certificate. And on that birth certificate, there's a QR code. And that QR code, you basically scan it, gives you a redemption code. It points you to pudgyworld.com. You go in, you sign up and make an account uh, via an email and a password. That in turn gives you a custody wallet via a custody wallet solution. Uh, and within a couple minutes of following the instructions on that QR code, you can buy and sell NFTs and put it on your forever pudgy penguin in real time. If you decide to mint it, it's a dynamic soul bound NFT. So the actual penguin itself I would argue is additive to our core collection, not dilutive, uh, because it's, you know penguin it's, is is soul bound, and so to have a you know tradable pudgy penguin asset, you need to go to Ethereum and spend the big dollars to do so. Uh, but it still makes people you know comfortable and have that digital identity and makes them feel a part of the community. And so in turn, you know we thought to ourselves, well, when you think about it, if you have a friend or a family member, it doesn't need to be a child or a niece or a nephew or a son or a daughter. It can, quite literally be a friend, and you wanted to give them your first touch point of the space, well, right now you're going to go and teach them about MetaMask and OpenSea and all of that. And that sounds like a really rigorous and time-consuming way to onboard a friend or a colleague into the space. Now, with Pudgy Penguin Toys, all you got to do is buy them an action figure, send the action figure to their house and just say, hey, follow the instructions. Within five minutes, they'll understand the beauty of Web3 uh, not to its full and final form. I'm a product perfectionist, and I think the product today has a lot of ways to go, and we know that, and we ship that knowing that. But in, it, in, its, in its most simplest and beautiful form, you know what it is to collect a digital asset, and you can understand why it's impactful. Now, if you really spend an extra 10, 15 minutes on Pudgy World after buying this toy and you actually go and sell a trait, there's been some amazing anecdotes and testimonials up until this point of people spending $60 worth of toys and selling $230 worth of digital traits. And then if you can really create that, if you can really make that mechanism sticky, which is really the hard part here and where we're working really hard to kind of create that feedback loop and that game loop to make sure that that's fun and engaging. But a world where, you know, that's an extreme example, maybe, you know, a world where somebody spends $20 on a toy and makes $30 back is a world where every single person who buys that toy is going to be like, holy shit, what is this? They'll ultimately learn that it's an NFT and the likelihood of them becoming a Web3 consumer is very high because this is one thing goes back to my early learnings. You know, one of the most beautiful things about NFTs and why I got so excited is because I bought my first NFTs for, you know, let's say $30,000 all in investment. And within a couple months, it was worth a million bucks. Of course, I'm going to love NFTs. It, it was that it was that return on profit that made me go and buy Pudgy Penguins that has led me to the position I am today. I mean, is it not? I mean, this is a common human behavior. Why do people buy sneakers and resell sneakers? Well, for the same reason, for this hope of turning a profit. And so if you can actually create a, an, an evergreen mechanism and actually make this work and sustain at scale, and this is like the very hard part, but if you can actually achieve that, one, I think we build, we have, it will ultimately lead us to building a multi billion dollar enterprise. But more importantly, I think it brings, it's going to excite so many regular people in, and get so many people onboarded in a way that I think the space has never seen before. And I honestly think people can't really imagine what this at scale actually working looks like. We have a long ways to go, not there, but I hope the foundation and, and the principle is clear for people because that's ultimately where we want to go. I think that's super smart. And I love like all the marks you're hitting there. Like not only are you creating a sustainable revenue stream that isn't reliant on getting liquidity from from your existing holders, but you're also putting this IP out there and really creating that onboard ramp for the next generation of potential Pudgy, Pudgy Penguins holders and fans and the like, um, like as you said, as a Trojan horse to Web3. Um, I'm curious, like 
in the post royalty world, like how do you think like community based projects like this can sustainably create these sort of revenue streams while still also driving value back to their holders? I think for us, how the two is intertwined is really through licensing. And so, you know, I told the community, I was like, it's pretty obvious that you have to create a real sustainable revenue stream, right? You have to do it because it's imperative for the longevity of the business. It's imperative to create, you know, uh, outside awareness. You know, one of the biggest blue chip killers of the last two years has been people not understanding how to make outside money, which ultimately led them to create more mints, which ultimately created more supply when there was not enough demand. That, if you look at all of the major projects that you thought had real potential, 99% of them failed for that reason. And they either got too greedy or they needed more money. And either two are, are neither positions that I want to be in. And so, you know, I believe that creating a real business that makes real money is imperative for the success of this company. And when I do that, I believe it creates sustainability internally, which allows me to not make desperate decisions to squeeze liquidity from my collectors. But I also think it creates more awareness. But beyond that, there's certain people, certain fudsters, I call them, where that justification is not enough. That's still not enough. I want more. I want more utility. So I thought to myself, well, we want to build Web3's first great IP company. How is this different than you know, how, how do we build this in the spirit of Web3 and not just the same way that they've been doing for you know, hundreds of years. The only difference now is we have an NFT that's our first edition Pokemon card. Well, I thought the story of, you know, if you could own a piece of Mickey Mouse, could you? And what would that look like? Well, to me, if you own a Pudgy Penguin NFT, the, 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 the bond between the success of the Web 2 brand and the Web 3 holder is really through licensing. Because I have a fiduciary responsibility to make product because I need to make money. And that's what you do when you have an IP business, you sell products. I have a fiduciary responsibility to make content because I'm an IP business and what is an IP without a story and a character and a personality. And when I do those two things, I need pudgy penguins. I need, I'm just going to need them because my brand's named Pudgy Penguins and I'm going to need characters to create those products and those stories around. And so I have two options. I can either make it myself, like we've seen a lot of NFT projects do, which I think is the wrong way to do it, or I can go to the community and say, hey, I'm making toys. I'm going to make money on these toys. I'm going to license the IP from you. Uh, and every time one of these toys sells, you'll make money in perpetuity. Or if I have a piece of content that I'm making or a huge moment, instead of saying, hey, I'm going to make this piece of content myself and create my own character, which right now we still do because of rigging issues and scalability. But now that we have resources, we're fixing that. You know, I would rather use pudgy penguin characters and bring that value back to you. And so the world now becomes where if I build a $100 million a year business or $500 million a year business selling real products, selling content to Netflix and Hulu and you know, a plethora of others, you know, I can translate that value back to holders directly through real monetary gain through licensing. And so you know, the elephant in the room in today is you know, NFT holders want monetary gain. Most founders don't want to talk about it because for some other reason, you know, maybe they're not succeeding or maybe it's just not the, what they want to talk about. But I understand because I was an NFT collector. I know what they want. They want monetary gain. And how are you going to give them monetary gain today? Well, today it's through airdrops of tokens and NFTs. And those two are liabilities. They ultimately create huge liabilities. And the best advice I got coming into this business was don't create liabilities for yourself. Go as long as you can without creating liabilities. So I have too many collections. I bought pudgy penguins with little pudgies and pudgy rods already existing. So I have no room to create more NFTs uh, today. And tokens are pretty far out because I don't think you know my NFT market cap is justified and warranted a, a token airdrop. And so you combine those two, you ultimately come to a conclusion that, hey, uh, I can't give monetary gain through creating items out of imaginary thin air and dropping it to you. So the only way I can give you monetary gain right now is through floor price going up, which I also can't control outside of me just executing and showing up every single day. And the only other option for monetary gain is create a real business and share that revenue. And the only way to share that revenue legitimately is through licensing because they own their digital asset. That is theirs. We That's not arguable. I'm, I'm, as the company, I'm saying it's theirs and it's their digital product and their digital asset. And I will license that IP from them uh, and use it 
uh, in the products and tools that I make. And, and that's a scalable way of monetary gain. That's a real way. I think if we really want this space to wave, we're going to have to shift away from the Ponzi nomics. We're going to have to shift away from creating the things out of thin air. They're nice. And I'm sure I'll do them at some point, but that cannot be the all end be all, right? That just has to be a feature. And I think today utility is really quantified around those two monetary metrics. And those two monetary metrics are built off of thin air, like nothing. Like there's created and dropped and, and speculated on and given. And so this is kind of how we plan on tying and accruing value back to holders at scale. And I think, you know, when you're talking about content, I can get to thousands of holders a year if I'm making enough money and I'm scaling enough. And so again, it's all about mutually aligned interests, mutually aligned incentives. You know, this is kind of how we structure the deal. And uh, this is how I think it makes sense. I love it. Let, let's let's talk a little bit about the, the that structure, dive in a bit. Like, so how does it work? Let's say you you are a pudgy penguin holder uh, and your penguin gets used for a pudgy toy. And uh, like, how does that work? And then how do you see that scaling with all of the kind of future plans that you have for the expansion of, of pudgy IP? Yeah, that's a really great question. Right now, the toys are done uh, through a licensing royalty where they get paid in perpetuity on an annual basis. So at the end of every year, we'll consolidate the revenue of the toy SKUs and we'll pay them out accordingly. Um, how we're going to do it moving forward is probably through non-exclusive upfront payments. So I'm just going to pay you for the non-exclusive right to use your pudgy penguin and an upfront payment on what I think the deal is worth. Uh, and I'm just going to send that directly to your wallet. And we actually developed a platform called Overpass, which we'll be releasing at the end of June, maybe the beginning of July, because I know there's a lot of big things at the end of June and we don't want to overlap with other people. I want other projects to get their shine. So waiting to define that. But you know, beginning of July, let's say, we'll be releasing Overpass to the world. And Overpass really solves Web3 licensing at scale. We incurred this problem. Um, it's a really our next big product and our next big feature. I kind of told the community I'm going on a 90-day sprint and the toys were kind of the first part of that. The second part of that, is, is Project Overpass and what I think Overpass is going to do for the space. Uh, to me, it solves one of Web3's biggest problems, as I clearly explained. I think licensing is the lowest hanging fruit in terms of utility that you can provide uh, to, you know, that projects can provide or companies can provide to their holders. And Web3 licensing today is a pain in the ass. And I learned it because we were actually the first major Web3 company to license IP directly from holders for a mass market product. And when we did that, we learned the hard way as to why no one had did it before, because it's a huge pain in the butt. And in reality, Web3 licensing should be done the Web3 way, which is a couple clicks of a button. Web3 extracts a lot of the friction and it hadn't been abstracted for the licensing business just yet. And so we made this uh, licensing, we call it a almost like a marketplace where you can if you're a company and you want to license IP, you make a deal, you issue the collections, the featured collections that you want on board, and they will basically submit proposals of their character and what they want to get paid for it. And with a couple of clicks of a button, they can send the money, sign the paperwork. It's all done on chain. It's freaking beautiful. And I, uh, I humbly think that it's one of the three most important pieces of technology that any NFT project has shipped ever. And I'm super glad to be releasing that at the beginning of July. That's incredibly exciting. Tell us a bit more about about Overpass. What you can like, kind of reveal about like the details there, and like how is it going to start with just with, with just pudgy penguins, and you'll open it up to other projects and other collections, or what? What is sort of your approach with uh, with bringing this kind of to market at scale? You got to give the pudgy penguins first dibs. At the end <laughs> of the day, we really built this for pudgy penguins internally, so we might create um, we might create you know we want to create a little bit of FOMO, right, and just get get the get the payments going to the pudgy penguins crew and make sure that the pudgy penguins are taken care of but once we create enough excitement i want to open up to the world again we really created this uh, initially it was really an internal software on how we were going to do it and then i thought to myself well we built it the space needs it um we could probably also make some money on it charging a fee per every transaction so why not ship it to the world and let that be you know web 3's gift from pudgy penguins to the world um kind of would bode well. And so for me, um, that's kind of how we're rolling it out and how we're structuring it. Uh, pretty sure that I'll have a couple of premier partners in mind. I would love for Doodles to use it because I think Doodles and I have very similar visions. I think they're doing a good job over there, uh, as well as a couple other projects that I have in mind that I think would be a really good fit. Uh, and then kind of just see how it goes. Uh, but uh, that's our vision for it. Uh, you know, what it looks like, I'll kind of leave that to a surprise and what it feels like. 
Uh, we also want to have some special deals and partners on there. I think a lot of people just misinterpret, you know, think about how many gaming companies reach out to me every single month to put a Pudgy Penguin in game. I could only I imagine. Waste, we waste my time. Ha just go to Overpass, go make a proposal, and then go ask Pudgy Penguins, and then go pay a Pudgy Penguin to put their character in a game, and then all of a sudden, now you have our IP. You know? Like, it's bigger than just like, oh, what does the brand do? Think about how much inbound comes to me that I just have to push to the side or push to two or three, you know, BD guys on my team. That's like wasting everyone's time. Just go to Overpass and submit. You want to work with Pudgy Penguins? No need to call me and try to get in touch with me anymore. Go to Overpass work with pudgy penguins you know makes a ton of sense and so you know you recently announced a fundraise of nine million which is no small feat in this market climate um how are you thinking about the use of those funds to scale the project and, and kind of take things to the next level yeah i think from my perspective uh, it's really just hiring like i i've learned this and you probably have too i mean you there's only so much one man can do there's only so much one or two men and women can do it's a uh, it's a team effort, and quality talent costs quality dollars. <laughs> it's just what it is. I actually learned the hard way in 2019. I had a business that failed, and I was asking myself why did it fail. And the conclusion that I came to was it failed because I was expecting top tier output from low level pay that I was paying people. How am I? You know, I had 15 guys rocking around my office in 2019. They were all getting paid four or five grand a month. And I was expecting them to do 15 grand a month work. Uh, and so this is kind of uh, a huge part for what we're doing. Building out the creative team specifically uh, is a huge focus of ours. Um, and uh, really building out the creative and tech team are my two focuses. Yeah. And I think you make a great point about like, you know, the, the relationship between incentives and results and also like being a founder, understanding that like not, not everyone's going to bring the same level of passion and commitment and drive that as you will to, to, because this is your baby, you know, that's, that's definitely a lesson to, to learn. Uh, I'm curious, like, you know, cause you've had this entrepreneurial journey that, that began, you know, well before Pudgy Penguins, but you know, is, is obviously, um, it, it's been great to see sort of the, the, that the efforts you've been making there kind of coming to, to a new fruition, um, over the past few months. What have been like some of the biggest sort of like lessons you've learned as an entrepreneur or like kind of pieces of wisdom that kind of guide your entrepreneurial approach? Yeah, this is great because I have learned so much in this business. Um, the first one is if you want to fire somebody, it's already too late. Fire them. Oh, this was such a big one. Uh, so many people that I'm like, should we fire them? If you even have to ask the question, you should probably fire them. It's already too late. There's no hope. Um, this is this uh, hopefully ho saves people time and money listening. Second one is do not underestimate the power of a meaningful org structure. Whoa, you can't, I can't tell you how many people were reaching out to me and I was feeling so overwhelmed. And then what we realized was, well, we're not following a real org structure. And the reason why I feel so overwhelmed is because people are not going to their managers or their department leads. They're coming to me. And I was like, ah, and the second we, we, we really stood up that org structure and really did it top down. And, you know, it's crazy because I've had businesses and been a part of businesses, you know, in a meaningful C-level, huge equity holder way that do nine figures a year in revenue. It, we had orgs, but it's not the same when you have so many moving pieces like this. Like this is like there's no room for error. And so when you're thinking in the mindset of no room for error, you need to be moving like a machine, like your org needs to be a machine. And so do not underestimate the power of org structures. If you can hire an executive coach, hire one, because being a CEO and an entrepreneur is actually a science. It's not just intuitive. And I've been using my intuition every step of the way up until about six months ago or five months ago. And then uh, last but not least would be, yeah, we'll call that it. We'll call that it. But I think those are a couple that are very meaningful. Oh, last one. Trust your team. This was the most important one for me. Mm. Your team is everything. I'm a stickler. I could tell you everything wrong with my business, things that you wouldn't even know. I could tell you things wrong with traits on NFTs. I could tell you a trillion things that are wrong with everything that I'm doing. Uh, and so I'm a micromanager in that respect. Uh, but you know, micromanaging your your peers, which is your C level group, is your peers, right? If I'm a chief executive officer, anybody in the C level unit are my peers, and they deserve to be treated with respect, and they deserve to be trusted. And if I can't trust them, fire them. Uh, there was somebody on our C-level suite that we recently got rid of 
I should have got rid of him six months ago because I didn't really have that uh, trust in his ability to do his job at a high level. And I was always questioning it. Second, I removed him. It, oh, here's another one. Uh, don't stick with something because it's convenient. Mm. Great one. Uh, I was the king of, hey, let's keep it the way it's going. It's working uh, rather than breaking it, rebuilding it, and then having it hit optimal efficiency. Like our social media strategy, for example. I was really pissed off with how we were doing social media for a long time, even though it was working. Uh, but it was working. That's all it was. It was convenient and it was working. We got rid of that person, hired a new person. This dude's doing everything I wanted him to do. You know, boom. Now we're hitting optimal velocity. Now, now, now I'm seeing the growth on the other channels. Now things are working the way it was. You know, I just had to bite the bullet, you know, get rid of what was convenient and what was working at the time. I was too afraid of breaking it. When in reality, nothing was getting broken. Uh, it was breaking itself. And so they, these are some really great nuggets. And I spent so much nights of pain and suffering and honestly tears figuring this stuff out. So I hope the people listening to, can extrapolate some of that information. Absolutely. And it certainly certainly can empathize as a, as a founder as well. You know, one of the things we always say at NFT now is uh, we're like constantly killing like the, 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 the existing version of our company to like rebuild and like and like and rethink, um, because especially in this space, it just moves so quickly. Like Web3 moves so fast. I always say like in this space, weeks are months and months are years. And so like thinking about that, like you com coming from Web2 and, and the entrepreneurial side there, like what have been you know, as you've adapted to like the, the two, two web three, like, um, you know, are there any like certain like personal practices that you that you use to like kind of stay grounded at, at in like this really fast paced environment uh, where things can change overnight and uh, there's constantly uh, new technologies, new innovations and and things rising and falling? Yeah, I like it because, you know, I'm younger. I'm on the younger side. I'm 24 and my attention span is short and so this is great because it's like a short attention span business and so i'm optimizing for myself this is really why i think you know people like where you know people in my age group are really going to get what it is to build an nft project i think better than the older generation because it's such a it's it's all about pivots and not pivoting the grand vision or the north star but pivoting the execution on how you get there it's like very flowing like water um it's like nothing I've ever been a part of. And I told the team this pretty much since day once I I had no I had no idea what I signed up for truly. And then when I signed up for it took it a couple months and I was like, oh, shit, what the what? Because I was living a very easy, good life, making a ton of money, not really having any stress. But honestly, that wasn't rewarding or fulfilling. This is this is like really pushing me to like my boundaries of what I think I can be as an entrepreneur. And for that, I'm thankful. But I told the team we win here when we win here, we will be able to win anywhere. I go back to e-commerce and direct to consumer. Anybody in that business better watch out for me because what I know now, that thing is a walk in the park. That is one of eight pillars for my business. E-commerce and direct to consumer is one of eight things that Pudgy Penguin is doing. I will go and mop the floor in any industry, I believe. And I say this humbly, I, 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 I really... Because we're all like, this is this is this is a publicly traded startup. I'm basically running a publicly traded startup in an emerging market where I'm appealing to having to make real money, technological innovations, you know, events, community, community on steroids. You've never been a part of community like this that have that have spent real bucks in supporting you. It's just like this unbelievable pool of a, of a company and a business model that ultimately, if you can succeed here, you can absolutely crush anything that you do. And I'm thankful to be in the position that I'm in uh, because I am I have evolved so much as an entrepreneur. And I really feel bad for the people that have left us up until this point because there have been a few because they're not going to get they, they're the people that have stuck through this. I can tell you, I can see the evolution. We're forming into a group of wolves. You know, we were puppies and now, you know, and, and a lot of people remain dogs and Labradors, but we're forming into a team of wolves cold-blooded killers dude and for that i am thankful because that's always who i wanted to be boom i love it i love it no the, the passion's really clear uh just speaking to you as well and so um as we move towards a close like what does the future hold for pudgy penguins like we love alpha anything you can tell us uh what's coming up we have overpass for building out pudgy world 
uh, amazing retail announcements for Pudgy Toys over the next coming months. And truth be told, I'm just going to do everything that we've been doing. I'm just going to keep doing it better, keep getting the content better, keep growing the followers to even larger numbers. And ultimately, I think when we talk next, Matt, um, I will be the face of NFTs and I'll be on the path to being the number one NFT project in the world with the highest floor price is really my objective. And so I believe we will accomplish that goal. I know we will get there. And uh, I'm thankful for you uh, having me on this interview today. Absolutely. Well, we've got our final segment bullish or bearish a little rapid fire round just a, a few few different topics hot button topics in the space bullish or bearish open c because i like them over there i really like their c level group but then the other yesterday i sold an nft two and a half percent marketplace fee with 0.5 percent creator fee dude how how and I love, and I love, I love their CEO Devin. They invited me to do a fire set, and these are the things I tell them to their faces, like not, you know, I know we're doing an interview, but like, dude, how? Blur is not doing that, dude. Blur is not taking two and a half percent marketplace fee, you know. Like, so, how does that make sense to you? How? I don't even want to answer this one. I got to pass. <laughs> There's I too many variables because my. My brain says, I like the guys. I like the team. We're not here without OpenSea. This is, this all be clear. There was many of NFT marketplaces before. None of us are here without OpenSea. Um, and so out of respect, I will say bullish. But part of my soul is bearish. And I Understood. hope OpenSea listens. And I, and, I tell, and I know I'm talking to them soon. And I will tell them the same. But dude, I was so pissed when I saw that. I said, no way did they just do this. I, I don't I don't sell any NFTs anymore, but I like I wanted to get rid of some things that like I didn't really care about to go get some erect guy and a couple other things. And uh, I sold one and I was like, huh? Two and a half percent marketplace fee? And you're not giving it. It's just nonsense. So uh, my I, I am grateful for OpenSea. I think they're a phenomenal group of people. Sorry for this fireside. I'm elongating it into a tangent. So we'll say bullish out of respect. But they need to they need to meet my respect where it is and and bullish with notes with notes bullish. <laughs> I like it. I like it. On the flip side, then uh, bullish or bearish blur. It's it, it almost gives you a similar answer because I have so much respect for Pac Man. I have so much respect for their ability to build and execute. Um, I think when you when you argue with pac-man the contrarian point which is against the blur point he has really good responses but if you really were to take a deep dive there's like a couple contradictions that always live right like blur points or you know hey you could solve some of the farming the ex excessive egregious farming by bumping the 0.5 to 1%. It's just, it's just as easy as that. 0.5% to 1%. I promise you all of the sloshing and the bullshit will be eliminated. I think it's it's as easy as that much of a tweak because then it doesn't make any sense. The math becomes less appealing and I know why he's doing it. So for the same reason that I gave OpenSea shit, I'm going to give him shit because like there's you, you have really good arguments. But if you like sit and digest the arguments for like five minutes, you can still piece it apart and, and there's still some contradicting factors. So I'm bullish because I'm bullish on their ability to execute and build and who Pac-Man is and who their team is. DD has been great as well. Uh, but I'm bearish on some of the fundamentals of what I think it is to really collect, right? Mm. We're talking about collecting. Uh, and I think ultimately, I think their final product will be optimized for what all the NFT users want. And I think right now they're just trying to vampire attack users so that people start to be programmed on blur. Right. So that vampire, they're just keep, but like the vampires, like no one's moving, like people who are on blur are staying on blur and people who are on OPC ears. like that. You don't need to do any more of that. So, you know, bullish with a hint of bearish, same with OpenSea, bullish with a hint of bearish. They have two problems that they need to fix. Uh, OpenSea, I think, is the creator's uh, uh, um, uh, marketplace. And I think Blur is the trader's marketplace. And let's find a happy medium to prevent the sloshing. And let's find a happy medium where the marketplace is not making 80% more than the creator. That makes no sense. And so uh, bullish and bearish for both of them. There it is. A good a good nuanced answer. These are hard uh, answers. 
I know, are, I know, I know. But yeah. it, 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 these are a lot of variables at play. No, they, these are good though. Sometimes we just get somebody just answers it straight up and gives no no rationale, and it's like it's much better to hear the thought process. You know. Um, all right, got two more. Bullish or bearish? Yuga Labs. Bullish. Can't fade Yuga though. I'll give the other. There's there's a bearish take. Mm -hmm. The bearish take is two things for Yuga. Too many NFTs, but I think that's what they're going for. But I think they're going to hurt, hurt their core audience if they go too far down this rabbit hole. But it's gaming, and I think that's inevitable. I think high quantity of digital collectibles in the ecosystem in gaming is like synonyms. They kind of work together. And I know that I, I know, and this is not, I, I, I wouldn't know, but I would assume that the royalty thing is a chink in the armor because they have the highest valuation, which means they have to meet the highest expectation for revenue. And mm -hmm. taking away the royalties is a hit on revenue. And what does that ultimately lead them to do? It's going to ultimately lead them to potentially do more mints, which I think there's only so many mints you can do before the armor begins to fail and you begin to lose. And as long as they are conscious of those two things, they will ultimately win. We are definitely not here without Yuga Labs. And I have the utmost respect for Gordon and Garga and the rest of the team. Uh, they inspired me to build here and without their raise and their success, I do not buy pudgy penguins. I can tell you that for a fact. And so, uh, so much respect, super bullish, but there are two bear scenarios that they need to be conscious of and they just cannot keep printing more and more NFTs. Uh, it will hurt them. Mm. Good points across the board. Final one, bullish or bearish Amazon's NFT marketplace. It can only be bullish. I don't think, you could, you know, it's only going to bring more awareness to the terminology. Uh, you know, it's not going to be like Coinbase all over again. They're going to do something. They're going to learn from those mistakes. And so bullish. There it is. Well, thank you, Luca. Appreciate you joining us. Great conversation and uh, very excited for everything to come uh, from the Pudgy Penguins. Well, that was an amazing conversation. So many gems uh, to, to pick out from that one. Um, I love Luca's confidence. I love how he called his shots. I love how he didn't shy away from tough topics. And I loved hearing his insights about how he's using Pudgy Toys as a Trojan horse to bring millions into Web3. At NFT Now, our mission has always been to empower the creators of culture and bring this technology from niche to mainstream. So hearing innovative ways of building sustainable revenue streams for projects while advancing mainstream adoption is music to my ears. Very excited to see what Luca continues to do uh, as he leads Pudgy Penguins into a new era. Speaking of new eras, if you like what we're building at NFT Now, I'd encourage you to learn more about the Now Pass, which is the key to the Now Network, the foundation for everything we're building for the future of tokenized media. Uh, you can learn more about the Now Pass at nowpass.xyz, and you can pick one up on OpenSea at bit.ly slash nowpass. We'd love to see you as part of our community. Uh, feel free to hop in our Discord at discord.gg slash NFT now. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week on the NFT Now podcast. Thank you again.